everybody. My name is Brent Griffith. I am co-host of the Broken Token Classic Arcade and the Pinball Podcast. Uh, my other, the other host, Wendy Roberts, is out here in the peanut gallery. Yes. Uh, Wendy, yeah. Peanut gallery represent. So uh, here we are at Grand Ole Game Room Expo 2018, and my presentation today is going to be on gaming and the art of imagination. So what does that mean? It, 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 in my mind, what I want to kind of walk through is how the art influences the game itself. So it's a discussion as to how box art, candid art, everything in the entire package forms and plays into the gaming experience. And specifically, we're going to look a little bit at consoles, video arcades, and pinball machines. Okay. So real quick, I'll say presentation, the time we've got allotted, about an hour, and any one of these individual areas we could talk at nauseum about. So this is going to be a kind of a quick skip through uh, this this topic. Okay. Well, I'm not even going to get into specific artists and, and how their work makes the game as much as the developers' work does, the programmers' work. So uh, it'll make a little bit more sense as we kind of get it, get through it here. So. Home consoles, we'll start with home consoles. They started to appear in the late 70s, and for those that were alive in that period of time, it was just dots, lots and lots of dots. And that was basically your artwork. You know, quick rundown of the, of the popular systems, the Odysseys, there was a whole line of the Odyssey systems. They really didn't survive the test of time. They're out there, people, they know the Odyssey name, but in reality, there's several Odyssey systems that was in that family. They're kind of lost a little bit of time. Uh, the Atari Pong and its clones. So this was uh, an example of the early Pong machine. And as ha we'll see in the arcade, there was just an unbelievable number of Me Too. So I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna be able to reproduce the circuit, and I'm gonna put a, a Pong clone out, and I'm gonna make some money. Patents. Fairchild Channel F, the Coleco Telstar systems, and many, many, many more. There was just a lot of the systems that jumped in this space, but it really started to kind of take hold in the late 70s and the early 80s when the market made some decisions. It was kind of like the VHS and beta. Something's going to something's going to bubble to the top, and kind of our market winners was the VCS uh, in '77, the Atari 2600. <coughs> You're in television in late 79 and 80 here in the States. And then ColecoVision to a lesser degree in terms of popularity. And then all that eventually leads into the NES coming into, into 85. Now if you kind of if, if you're familiar with these systems, you'll realize that as you go down this list, the artwork, the art packages, the graphics ability of these games start to sharpen. As you're marching through time, processors get more powerful. Uh, uh, circuit design comes down, parts come down, and processing power comes up. And also people start to wring more out of the systems. They understand what you can do with, what, with what's available. And I'll show that a little bit around uh, the Atari and the, the Intellivision lines. All right, so perfect example of art in your imagination gaming is combat. All right, so this was the packing game, initial packing game for the 2600. A lot of people don't realize that there was actually box art for combat. I want to say that this, to a certain degree, this artwork appeared on some of the 2600 boxes themselves, to some degree, to advertise the game that was included. You know, you've got a game system and a game, so you could play right away for your money. There was later 2600 revisions that had other packing games. Pac-Man was a good example. You know, that was the attempt to revitalize one of the several attempts to revitalize the 2600. We're going to get the Pac-Man license. The game didn't turn out so well, but that became the, the marquee packing title to sell systems. Around that time, combat was still available at that time over the counter in a box. So take a look at the artwork that comes with, that comes on the 2600 version, box version of combat. It, this gives you an idea of what the game is about. And you gotta remember back at this time, we had no internet, we didn't have 
all of the knowledge in the world at our fingertips on our phone, I remember walking through the aisles at a local Toys R Us or service merchandise and looking at these boxes and this artwork on the front and then hopefully screenshots on the back to give you an idea of what you were actually buying. You know, I'm sure we've had that experience where the game, at least visually, doesn't line up with what we think we're, we're buying into by looking at the artwork. This artwork is what has to draw you in, to give you an idea of what's in that box, all right? To a certain degree, Atari and some of the other systems, even up through, Nintendo did it quite a bit, they would have kiosks in stores. I'm not much of a modern gamer. I know that's still, though, a common thing. I'll see them in, in Walmarts and uh, Targets and the like, where they'll actually give you a little hands-on, but they can't do that with every game. So you're still kind of relying on that box to give you an idea. So what are you in the combat? Tanks. It's up to your mind. I remember as a child, translating what you're seeing on the right to what you see on the left on the lower portion of that box to fill in the blanks to get that visual transferred to the screen. Because basically, this is what you've got with the 2600. You've got a series of dots. You don't have high resolution. You don't have a lot of movable characters. You don't have a lot of colors. And speaking of resolution, take a look. This, I grabbed this, this particular picture for a reason because the tanks are angled. You, you, you don't even have enough resolution for really good smoothing. When the tanks are north, south, east, or west, they look kind of tank-like. Anything else, they look kind of blob-like. But hey, with a little bit of the growl of that engine, it sounds like a tank when you're playing the game. You've got biplanes, and this is an example of yet again, hey, I, I'm not sure what that is, if I just had the cart. But having seen the art, take a look over there to the left, you know, as the eight-year-old Brent could do, I could fill in in my brain that I'm flying this airplane. And uh, that's kind of, I don't know, up here at the top under the zero, that might look a little alligator-ish. I don't know what that looks like. But does, is that a car? Is that something with two wheels out to the single? I don't know. But I do understand my brain is able to tell me, through the assistance of the artwork, what I'm actually doing and what I'm saying. And again, I did grab this picture with the planes in a, a non-compass uh, direction so you can see what the limitations were. And, you had to imagine you were flying that biplane. But we could also mix it up a little bit with clouds, or a lake, or whatever that's supposed to be. I'm assuming it's a cloud, because again, take a look here over to the left at, our, at my artwork. It's showing those planes in action in the sky. That's a cloud. At least it was to eight-year-old Brent. So I don't know about everybody else. We could fly jets or triangles with a nose. What, you know, is that a kite? I, I'm not sure. And again, it's just another example of comparing the artwork to the game that you actually got and then using your imagination to fill in those gaps before the game itself, the technology and the hardware could keep up with and more accurately, accurately represent what you were doing. So a couple more uh, uh, console games here, and we're going to stick around in that 80s vintage because of, earlier, as I sh had shown, as you start to get yourself into more current systems, the graphics step up. And it shifts a little bit, and we'll get into that a little bit on the arcade side, where the art in the game now helps you with that world that you're recreating. So Centipede is I picked this for a particular reason because we can show this in the arcade. And you'll notice through the slides here, I tried to pick some games that people know as well as games that people don't know to kind of prove that point. And uh, Centipede is one of the games everybody kind of knows from the arcade. This was the box art from uh, Atari from the 2600. Now, what I find is interesting is your avatar in the game is supposed to be an archer. And when we get to the, the side art in the, in, in the arcade, you'll see that. The artist in this case drew the 
drew the avatar with a magic wand or something. He's shooting something at the centipede. And I've yet to figure out why this, this spider has loafers on. <laughs> Call that a little artist interpretation. But to a certain degree, if you were to see this in the store, and maybe not have been in the arcade, you've got an understanding, okay, I'm a wizard, I'm a magician, I'm somebody, and I'm fighting centipede with hands and gloves. I, I don't know. Fill that in, in your brain where you like. Little artist, artistic license there. Still, it gives me an idea of what I'm going to see. But I don't exactly know which dot I am once I get to the game. So here we are. This is 2600 version of centipede. And... I think I'm this dot, but I'm supposed to be this little guy over here. I'm the wizard, I'm the elf, I'm the magician, I'm whatever my mind interprets that art to be, and that's my character, that's my avatar, I'm playing the game, and this, the centipede, that's who's coming to get me. An eight-year-old Brent, or eight-year-old, or six- or four-year-old, however you are, if you happen to play this game, that is your guideline to what you're seeing on the screen represented in that, that current iteration of technology. Maybe a different board will give me a better idea as to what I am. It just changed colors. This is the technology we had. You know, the levels would progress, and the big way to show that, the main way to show that, was the same thing, but a little different, a little different being the colors a little different. I'm still a little block, and my mushrooms are still smaller blocks. My centipede is left to interpretation. But yet again, the art kind of helps you get yourself into the mindset of that game. So let's move forward a little bit into the, into the early 80s with an Activision game, Kaboom. So this was for the 2600. And for those that know or maybe don't know the history of Activision, the founders started out as developers for Atari. And for various and sundry reasons, they decided to go off and create Activision. And, and Wendy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Activision was the first third party developer for the 2600. They created their own games. Part of it had to do with they wanted their, their names on the games, a little creativity they felt was being stifled. So they spun off and created Activision. You're walking down the aisles, and you see an Activision game. And this is the art for Kaboom. So it looks like, you know, this is your classic kind of guy in jail, bad guy, prison guy. He's got his black and white striped suit on, and he's got his little thing across his eyes. He's supposed to be the bad guy. And yeah, he's dropping bombs. And it looks like, uh, I don't, you don't know exactly what's going on with the bucket here, but when you get into the game, they do a pretty fair approximation of showing you what this game is going to look like, all right, what, what you're actually playing. Now, there's still a little left to interpretation. You know, Activision was an awesome developer. And they really were able to ring a lot out of the 2600. That, I'm not sure what we're doing here. But with the assistance of the artwork, I mean, who read the manual? Who, who's, who read the manual to see what that was actually supposed to be? But with the assistance of the artwork, you can not only see on the package, get an idea of what you're doing, but now you, your brain can fill in the gaps to, to the actual gameplay and get the idea that the developer was going for. All right, so this is, this is Mega Mania. I played a lot of this when, when I was younger. Again, by Activision in, in 82. A little different here in that with, with Kaboom, you had an avatar, you had the bad guy. You could see the stripes on his outfit and realize that that is kind of, as I said, that's uh, accepted as an old school way of, hey, this is the bad guy, and this, you know, kind of like cowboys would, would ride in with the white hat. Okay, he's supposed to be the good guy for whatever reason. Here, you have nothing in our reality, per se, to ground you as to what you're supposed to be doing. It is a space scene, all right? We don't live on spaceships. So they're trying to communicate in the artwork the situation that you're going to face in the game. <coughs> I'm guessing, since I have multiple ships <coughs> coming 
toward me that I'm probably going to be defending myself against them. And then since I have this one little ship pointing that direction, for some strange reason, they're going to line up British military style, and they're going to come after me, and my job is to defend myself against them, okay? And again, they do a pretty fair approximation of telling me what I'm doing in the game through the box art that I'm going to see. And in my opinion, Activision was pretty good about that. Atari tended to do a lot of almost lifelike scenes. We saw that earlier in combat. It looked like a real airplane. It looked like a real tank. Acti or Activision tended to be, for lack of a better term, a little bit more on the cartoonish side in terms of their drawing, which actually closely mimicked what they were able to do on the screen. And then they were still able to convey an idea to the gameplay and add a little bit of detail to it that they couldn't do on the screen. So I know right off that the ships I'm facing here, we always used to call that this the hamburger level, okay? They pretty darn near approximate the ships that are on the right side of their, of their artwork. So here I can put the gameplay together. And as a, as a gamer, as a, as a young Brent out buying these games, back in the day they were 30, like $29. So think of $29, $39 in 1982 money versus today. I don't know how that translates up, but I'm assuming it's 60 to 70 dollars today. So I, I've gone out and I've cut a lot of grass and I'm gonna go buy this game and I see what's on the box and then I see how the game actually plays and there's not a huge leap in my mind to fill those two, tie those two together. And I like this, I know Activision's gonna get my attention next time around. They're gonna have, I'm gonna see what I'm doing and have, have a, a little bit more of a better experience. Over on the Intellivision side, Intellivision was a little later in the, the 2600, this is their version of combat, in my opinion. It's a game called Triple Action. So we've got airplanes again, we've got tanks again, and it looks like we've got some kind of Mad Max car truck scene going on down here. Not entirely sure, but it seems like I've got some kind of car deal, maybe auto racing. Get into the game and, okay, well, this is an art, but it kinda is. There is an art to user interfaces. There are people that specialize in the user interface on your television and helping people work through what that system does and how it interacts with you. So Triple Action, they jump right in and they give me a menu. Okay, I got a little better idea of what I'm doing. I'm gonna, am I gonna fly planes? Am I gonna race cars? Am I, am I gonna battle tanks? It still ties to the artwork that was presented on the package. So, Here's triple actions tanks and uh, uh, some trucks, which I guess that shows. I'm pretty sure that it is because of the greenery. This gets back into the art of imagination. My mind is filling that in like hamburgers on Meg Mega Mania. What is that? What am I seeing? What world am I in? I chose this picture. Uh, again, if you take a look at this tank up here, there Resolution's a little better. That looks a little bit more tank-like in my mind, but it's still open for a little interpretation. However, in your mind, you know that that's a tank and you know what you're doing and you know these are barriers and you know those are trees or shrubs and away you go into playing the game. And here's the auto racing. Uh, don't drive angry. Who knows what that's from? Everyone, I don't want oh, Groundhog's Day. Groundhog's Day, thank you. Uh, pretty good in terms of the art. There's not a lot to fill in here from the artwork on the package to the artwork on the game to tell you what you're doing. Their development work is, is quite nice here. And here is their biplanes. Now, this is a I'm not sure kind of what we got going on here. And this, in my mind, is one of those leaps where we take the menu, we take that little bit of artwork, which is telling us what we're doing, we take the package, we've got happy little clouds here. It looks a little bit more cloud-like, 
but our mind is still working here in the adventure that is this game and making that a vibe play. Um, I've never, has anybody played this game? As I was going through the slides, I was unsure as to what this is. I'm assuming that's a hot air balloon. And again, that's kind of your mind at work and telling you, you know, that it can kind of be what it, what it, whatever you want it to be. As a child playing this game, I'm sure the manual would help you out. Maybe a picture is part of the game. But again, they've got a lot going on here. And I think they've communicated pretty well what you're doing and moving that into the, to the artwork itself of the game. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the combat and the tanks, uh, triple action tanks, and the planes, uh, the biplanes specifically. And again, some of this is related, the differences is related to the power of the system to provide the art that is your playground. However, it's still pretty rudimentary, especially by today's standards, and it's very rudimentary by arcade standards as you're coming into the vintage of the Intellivision. And that's that cost trade-off. How much can you sell this system for? What kind of time can you put in the development of work? And what can people do in their own minds related to the artwork that I'm able to present to go ahead and communicate what you're trying to do in the game? All right, so this is an Imagine game called uh, Tropical Trouble. And it's 83, so we're moving forward a little bit. Uh, new Tropical Trouble, now with more uh, ogre. So who does not, as soon as I saw this, I was like, that has got to be the guy that played Ogre in Revenge of the Nerds. And I really wish that there was a way to look up the characters. You know, I'm sure even if it is that gentleman, he was probably just a character actor at the time, like this guy back here. So this artwork's a little different. This is actually photorealistic artwork. This was a picture at some point in time. And it's pretty obvious, Ogre here's the bad guy. And he's, he's just looks like angry. Because I doubt he is, he is trying to go, he's going after this guy, I doubt he's the bad guy. He looks like, I'm in this situation, I'm gonna be in the tropics, the name, and my avatar is gonna be this character, and I am trying to stay away from Mr. Ogre there, try to get away. This is a game of avoidance. That's what this game happens to be. And sure enough, that's what I'm doing. To a certain degree, I am trying to avoid this gentleman, yet I'm trying to uh, save my girlfriend. That's the, that's the premise of the game. So as you travel through the tropics, uh, I'm not sure how the volcanoes relate, but Without the volcanoes, as an example, here, I, I don't know what these are. The art helps me, in my imagination, fill this in as lava. And again, I'm working my way as the avatar, as the, the hero here. I'm working my way through the play field, avoiding, that's the gist of the game, avoiding snakes and uh, grass and shrubbery, and I have to make my way through, avoid the lava to the end of the level. All right, so let's move into the arcades a little bit. So as we get into the, the, the 70s, we're still working with dots, lots of dots in the arcade, dots like we're working with in the home consoles, but we start to get some lines in there. And you know, we've got Atari with Pong, and that's their killer app, everyone knows Pong, and how it was cloned across the world, not only in the home consoles, but also in the arcades. Um, processing a gunfight. So the, the little story behind that is, is gunfight, we're still lines, the art is getting a little better. This is the first game with a processor. Prior games were all solid state. Uh, all logic, ones and zeros, ons and offs, still kind of that same story with a game like gunfight with a processor, but a processor is going to execute code. You can get graphics in it a little better because you're not hardwiring the graphics into the hardware. You're able to actually write the images, for lack of a better term, into the game code. And then as you move into uh, Asteroids and Battlezone, this is a little bit more realistic in terms of what, what you're doing. You know, the artwork for Asteroids and the name for Asteroids shows you as a ship in an asteroid field. You don't, you don't have solid rock here. These aren't solid objects. 
their lines. That artwork, though, helps to communicate what you're doing in that game. So here's Atari's Pong, and everyone's familiar with that. I'm sure they've seen the ca uh, pictures of the cabinet or the real cabinet, and everyone's familiar with the game. You're this uh, line to either side, and you're trying to keep the, the ball, the puck, the whatever it is, the die in play. As those were cloned, here's an example of where art added a little twist to the game and helped the player uh, reimagine what you were doing. Pong, pretty stark. And in all honesty, it was what it was. It was so new, it was so revolutionary. People had never seen anything like it. So it kind of stood for it on its own. It was just amazing to people at that time to be able to control something on a television screen. It was really amazing to have like the whole console pong that I had a picture of earlier and to take that into your home and plug that into your TV and turn a dial and make something move. So it could kind of stand alone as just what it was. As the clones started to come out, take a look at this. This is from Allied, uh, Allied and it's called Paddle Battle. And the artwork is of tennis. So it's the exact same game, other than that they just, you know, the dots are a little different here when they separate the halves of the play field. But what am I doing? I'm playing tennis. That's what I'm doing in this game. This, this does not look like a tennis player, but it does in your mind if you are, when you're playing this game, you're getting competitive and you're playing with somebody else. I'm going to, let's go play tennis. All right, so this is a game from Fun Games Incorporated. And it's some kind of game of dots and rings. Does anybody care to guess what I'm doing here? If you were just to see the screen, and this, and I apologize for the picture, the only way to get a picture of a game like this is actually from gameplay. This is a, this is a little older black and white game with no processor, so they're not easily emulated. You don't have ROMs. So, the, the easiest way to get a picture is to actually have the game. This isn't my game, I scraped it off the internet. But does anybody care to take a guess at what you're doing here? No takers, okay. It's by play, and it's the plain game of dots and rings. Now, take a look at the artwork that surrounds the vessel. You've got your eye plane, you've got clouds. It's obviously full of action, thrills, and fun, because the art is telling me that. And, you know, the, the name of the game and then the artwork that it, it accompanies it, all right? So the artwork, again, helps the mind, helps the imagination fill in what you're doing on this play field. This is kind of a cool game. Uh, it's made by XD in 1979, and it's a game of dots and lines. Does anybody recognize this game or care to take a guess as to, as to what you're doing? There's something on there that is a fairly decent graphic that might give you a, an idea. It's a driving game, but I can't remember. I played it, and I can't remember the name of it. You're right, it is a driving game, so it's, it's car-based. And it's called Crash. So, take a look here. This, is, uh, this counts as art, in my opinion. Here's the base play field. All right, it's a black and white game. Black phosphor, you know, white lines when, when, the, uh, when, when the game's up. The bezel has artwork to show you what your avatar is. So, okay, those are Formula One cars, and I, I can kind of see it here. Take a look at this car here to the right. That kind of has the, the four wheel with a little bit of an air dam look. I, I don't know why this particular car looks like it's got a, a funnel on the front of it, but I can see the artwork. I can fill that in in my mind. And if you take a look at the actual game over here to the left, you'll notice it's blue, all right? So this is a leap into inexpensive technology to add a little bit more to the game, to add a little bit more to the artwork that's actually possible in the game and through, the, through the use of colored filters and gels. So you, you'll see that like on Battlezone. If you look at an Atari Battlezone, it's two colors. If you pull the gels off, it's just a black and white monitor underneath it but the gels add that additional bit of layer that ties into the artwork that's possible in the game to make it that much more exciting and that much more fun. So yeah, this is a, a driving game. 
And the, the idea here is, this is actually, it's, it's a very simple game. If anyone ever sees it, I, I really recommend they play it. It's kind of addictive. You'll see these, I think this is pretty common on the 16 one JAMA boards. The original games, I don't think I've ever seen an original. But the intention is, is it's kind of Pac-Man-esque. You're trying to get the dots. And one of the cars is you, one of the cars is your foe, your computer foe. You can change lanes at these north, south, east, and west coordinates, and you're trying to avoid your enemy. You're trying not to crash into him. What's, what is just uh, gut-wrenching about this game compared to like a Pac-Man, a Pac-Man, you make a wrong turn and it's got you. It's, uh, this game, if you time it wrong and you change lanes, say here, and then your enemy manages to change lanes. If you get out of sync with him just a little bit and you're ahead of him, you slowly watch yourself go right to total doom. So it, it is, it's fun, addicting, and it's frustrating. And again, the artwork is kind of giving me an idea. For some reason, we're two F1 drivers running opposite directions on the same course. But hey, it is what it is. This is, this is what I'm envisioning over here on the play field. All right, so here's Centipede. And we're all familiar with this. I would be willing to bet the Atari Classic Centipede. Uh, uh, if you remember the art from the, cad, uh, excuse me, from the console game, the Centipede looks a little less happy here. No, uh, no loafers, no uh, five fingers. He's got claws, he's got fangs, he's got deep red eyes, and he just generally looks like he's had a rough day, okay? And the artwork follows through into the, into the header, into the marquee, and of course this is, this is the classic centipede side art. Now, what's not represented here is your avatar. And I mentioned earlier that you're an archer. The only reason I, I happen to know that is somewhere along the line, I, I've either read a manual, or I picked that up. Your character is supposed to be an archer and you're shooting arrows. Everyone that I've talked with, they've had a little different interpretation of what your avatar is because in my mind, there's nothing to tie. When you walk up to this game, there's nothing to tell you in the artwork, the presentation, what you are. Okay? And honestly, the reason I may think it's an archer is from having set dip switch settings on these games. Because a lot of times in the manuals, it won't say X men or X characters or X players. It'll it'll have your avatar. In Donkey Kong, it said Jumpman. Mario wasn't Mario in Donkey Kong. Mario was Jumpman. If you look at the dip switch settings, it says Jumpman. I'm pretty sure now that I think about it, in in Centipede it says Archer. But you don't know that looking at the artwork. So a little better representation in the actual game uh, as to what you're doing. You've, you've got uh, more processing power. These games are much more expensive, so there's more hardware in them compared to a home console. Uh, you're renting the game at a one quarter at a time, you know, so you don't, you don't have that high cost of entry. And that hardware, that money, the expense the operator paid gives you a much better play field. And if you take a look at the artwork versus the game itself, it's pretty, pretty darn close. You know, you know that centipede is out to get you. He's coming out at you. You know that these are mushrooms. The artwork of the game can a little better approximate the, the artwork of the playfield can a little better approximate the artwork on the side of the cabinet on the marquee. Yet there's still a little left for interpretation. Okay, this is bringing you into the game in the arcade, walking around with your quarter, like the box art brings you to the game at your local store back in the day. Okay, so armor attack. This is a little different than Centipede. This is a vector game. Centipede is a raster game where you're actually drawing with pixels, you're drawing your objects, you can get a little bit more detail. We saw that it can pretty well closely approximate with, within reason of the hardware at the time, what the art has. When you get into a vector game, it's drawn with lines, okay? So this is Armor Attack, this is a, a Cinematronics game. If you take a look at 
the side art. And, and if you all, if anyone here collects arcades or even when you come to these events, one of the things I like to do is I like to play games that I don't see because this may be my only opportunity to play that type of the game. A perfect example of what we're talking about is in the back corner of the game room, there's an Atari night drive. It's a black and white game. You're driving down a street at night. The play field is just a bunch of dashes side by side, parallel, that start to swerve that approximates the turns in the road, okay? That's pretty much what's on the, on the screen. The side art, Atari side art is beautiful. It's a thing to behold. The side art gives you an idea as to what you're really doing. As well as the bezel art, and this we'll touch on that here with armor attack. The bezel art gives you the dash of the car and makes you feel like you're looking through the windshield of the car and you're driving. Okay, so that all ties together to help you in your mind fill in the blanks and tell you what you're doing in the game and get into the game. All right, so Armor Attack, this is Cinematronics 1980. And if you take, well, first of all, the name, Armor Attack, sounds like it's gonna be tanks. Take a look at the side art. Hey, that's tanks. Okay, I got an idea what I'm doing. It looks like I'm in some kind of battleground scene. I see a helicopter. Cinematronics wasn't real good with their marquees. And this gets into like what I was saying with night driving. Check out the sides of these games, especially when you go to a show and you've got some spacing where you can see. You'd be amazed at what's there. Uh, oddly enough, in my game room, I'll make some decisions as to where to put games if, I can, if it's a game where I want to showcase the side art. And, you know, I, I'll even put games next to pinballs like I've got a Tron right now next to a pinball machine because that side art, I'll, I'm a Tron fan. It, it's not, it's sort of photorealistic, but it really stands out and I wanted to showcase it. It took the place of a centipede because that side art is beautiful. And eventually I'm gonna have to unshroud a couple other games and bring it out because the side art, in, in my opinion, and the marquee art, if they chose to do so, is as much of the game experience as the game is itself. So here's, this is Armor Attack Flyer. This is what the operators would get back in the day, trying to entice them to buy the game, all right? Again, no YouTube, no internet. They can travel to a couple shows a year, play the games, but there was more games coming out, especially in the heyday, then you could showcase at shows. There just wasn't enough shows. You couldn't go to a show every weekend. It was impossible. So flyers was the way that this was communicated. That, that front of the flyer looks very similar to the side art. A little different, but it gives you an idea. Okay, this game is going to be some kind of war type game. Don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm the Jeep, if I'm the tank, what, what I am. Here's the back. The back of the flyer, cabinet picture, that's, operators like to see that. They, uh, would look at the, uh, uh, at the marquee. Hey, is that going to draw people in? Has anybody seen the Qbert swearing marquee? Okay, there's some people that aren't shaking their head. So on the side art of Qbert, he's got the little speech balloon and it's just like asterisk, exclamation point, da 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 da, like he's cursing. The original run of Qbert's, that was what was on the marquee. A few of them sold. But the reports back to uh, Gottlob, what, Gottlob, right? Gottlob was, nobody knows what the game is. They don't know what to call it. Let's go over and play, I don't know. They changed it and put Qbert on it. So now you had the Qbert character, I should put a slide in here, I'm sorry. You had a representation of the art that was on the game, the play field, and you had a name. You were communicating everything about the game in the little space that was the marquee. So, Cinematronics so is new. Anyway, so here's the play field. Now, um, if you read the features as an as a operator, which every good operator should be, you'll realize that this is a vector game. So what does that mean to an operator? That means that it's going to be a black and white game. It's going to be drawn in lines. But we'll take a look back here at the, at the picture. Take a look at the cityscape that you've got going on here. Okay, kind of similar to what we were talking about with Battlezone, where you've got that gel overlay. Well, in an armor attack, and a lot of games of this era, 
you've got that color gel overlay to add a little bit to the game art, but now you've got artwork on top of that to help you fill in the blanks as to what you're doing, what's on the play field. And in this case, they've drawn in the, the buildings for the cityscape, okay? So here's the comparison of armor attack without an overlay. This is what you've got. You have no idea, in the real game, when you're playing with the overlay, you can't drive through the buildings. You need that overlay, that artwork, to fill in the rest of the play field, to complete the package, to help you in your mind make the leap to what you're doing to actually play the game. So you know, you've got a really tight tie between the art and the game itself here. Not only from the side art to tell you what you're doing, from the flyer to tell you what you're buying, the player to tell you where you're at, where you're going, what you can, what you can't do. All right, so let's jump into pinball. And it's a game of skill. Yeah, yeah. That's open to interpretation. You know, you're either good or you're good. Uh, so pinball, it, had, it shifted from a game of chance to a game of skill. All right, chance being, we all know the history, it was associated with gambling. All right, so the short of all that is, is as the hammer started coming down on pinball as a gambling game, you had to start, there had to be other things to turn it into an entertainment game, okay? So your value for your money shifted from the potential to win something else of value, whether it was money, or beer from the bar, or a pack of cigarettes, or whatever they were doing, it had to shift to entertainment. That was the value that you, did, that you got from the game. As that happened, several things were introduced in this game. So first of all, uh, Humpty Dumpty is a really good example of a jump forward to try to add entertainment value. It was the first game with electromechanical flippers. Now there were flipper games before, they were mechanical, and that played into a way to draw people into this game. Okay, I gotta, the gambling games were like the bingos with all the holes, and I've got to fill this line, you know, I get so many balls, okay, well, we're going to jump a little bit, draw a player in, we're going to add a flipper so they can keep a ball into play. As we're shifting away from that, you know, flippers become the standard as opposed to the, some games have and some games don't. And where we're getting into this is you have to now start also adding artwork to go with the story that you're telling in the game. The draw is less, again, of I'm going to win something potentially that's tangible to this is just going to be a good experience. All right? Flippers, technical stuff added to that, advanced rule sets, as the EM games become more complex in the computer games. And then, of course, the artwork starts to come in to draw people in to start telling that story and, and filling in in your mind what you're doing. So here is a perfect example. New art, but the game remains the same. Gottlieb was one of the, if you want to call it, leaders in this area of using artwork to repackage a game and bring people back in and tell a new story in that game. So here's four games. Now take a look at those play fields. Uh, to the right here, it uh, looks like uh, Old West Lucky Strike. I doubt that has anything to do with cigarettes. Um, not sure exactly. It looks like it, uh, maybe some kind of Buck Rogers-y kind of helmet with the wings on. I don't know what this is. Target Alpha looks like some kind of fantasy space deal. And this on the far end, El Dorado, looks a lot like Lucky Strike, but the art's a little different. There's something else going on here. But take a look at the play fields. It's all the exact same layout. All right? And what's interesting is, is they use that layout on several games from 75 through 77. <laughs> yeah. People must have liked the layout, or hey, well, let's just let's just rinse, wash, and repeat. They're using the artwork. They're using the, the same layout. They're using different artwork to do something different, to tell a different story. And as if you see one, two, three, four, 
five, six, as if that wasn't enough, they actually pulled it back out of mothballs in 84 on the premier platform. And uh, this is actually a quote from the flyer over there, exciting graphics package with up-to-date romantic adventure theme. So I'm not sure how the romantic adventure theme transitions over the decades, but apparently they were on the, on the cusp of the adventure theme in the 84. Again, this is the same, it's the same play field. They've re-arted it, if that's a word, to tell a different story. Speaking of telling a story, is the art worth all that? I mean, what is it really kind of doing for me? Take a look at that. This is a whitewood. And sometimes whitewoods will show up at shows. This is, for folks that don't know, this is an example of a game that a vendor uh, would build up trying to physically dial in the shots. You can only do so much on paper or with CAD or you don't really know until you put it on wood and you try to play it, okay? Anybody have any idea what game that is? Or maybe even what you're trying to do? And, and keep in mind, like with the Goblin examples we had, just, we had just had up, a lot of good developers, good game designers, can have a design in their mind and translate that into anything they want with the art package and the game, you know, the, the game rule set related to the art package. Anybody care to take a guess? No, no. It's roller coaster tycoon. Look how much different that looks when you lay the artwork on it. It takes that blank canvas and turns that into you being a theme park owner. This is from 2002. From, uh, from Stern. And it, it's just amazing how that how the artwork plays into what you're doing in the game. And, and again, if you think about this, say, um, I, I don't know if I'm talking about who designed, designed that. Is that a Lawler game, I think? Don't quote me on that. But if the, the designer had, had some shots in mind and was given a theme, often and not, more often than not, when you talk to the designers, they've already kind of got, I've got this concept for this new shot, for this new gadget, for this new whatever, and if it works for the theme, they'll marry the two. It, it, and it kind of ties, some things will come before the theme, some will come after, but a lot of times, it's not uncommon, you'll have a layout, and then you can adjust it to the theme that you're given or a theme that you've come up with if it's an original theme game. Okay, so here's what the art helps you to do. The art helps you envision this world that you're in. The ball is your avatar in this world. It's your character, it's your car, it's a spaceship. It's even a ball, like in some bowling games. The ball is just a ball. It's still your character. Uh, be the ball, as Ty Webb once said. Does anybody know who that is? We got one. <laughs> Caddyshack. Uh, the art helps the imagination fill in the gaps of the story behind the game. So this is the upper play field at high speed, and as with all these images, I stole them from the internet. So if anyone seeing this, if this is yours, thank you. But and then this one's kind of a little weird. High speed gets a lot of play. This is the story of Steve Ritchie in a car chase in his Porsche. I think it was a Porsche, and. You, the ball, as the ball, are Steve driving his car. And once you get to the point to start multi ball, you need to get away. And to get away, you make various shots. To get to the point of starting the car chase or multi ball, you have to drive the car to various locations, hit various targets to start qualifying yourself through the game. That art helps you imagine yourself as that character played out by the ball. Here's taxi, it's another game and, uh, where, you're, where you're a car. Your ball is the taxi, and that artwork helps you uh, navigate the play field, play the game. Far left, or not far right over here, you're far left. You're picking up the passengers. And for example, if I wanna go pick up Pinbot here, there's where Pinbot is, that's where I have to send my taxi, my car. The artwork tells me, the insert tells me, the game tells me 
helps me realize I'm a taxi, that's where I got to pick up Pinbot, this is what I got to do to get Maryland. Okay? The artwork again ties all that together for us. Back to the Future Data East, you can time travel with Pinbot. And again, it's the art that takes you there. You can go to Hill Valley, you can go to the courthouse, you can go back in time. If you think about it, you can strip the artwork off this, rethink it, tell another story. Art fills that in for you. Now, licensing is an interesting aspect of the artwork because, as I keep saying, art creates or recreates uh, the world in the story, whether it's licensed or it's an original theme. But in a licensed game, the license holder plays a part. And this is a perfect example because it's now Back to the Future starring Brad Ferris in the role of Marty. You are trying to tell the story. You're using that artwork in the game. However, if you're doing a licensed theme, you are beholden to the license holder because they want their IP respected. And, and I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with people call them the Photoshop games, where you've got just pictures out on the play field that look like stills from a movie or a television show. And I'm sure that it's not that the artist just phoned it in that day and said, I'm just going to throw some pictures down on a play field and call it done. In the case of your theme games, they have to work with the license holder. In this case, Michael J. Fox didn't want his image on the game for whatever reason. You know, it's whether it was he didn't like pinball, he thought it was still associated with gambling, he just didn't think it was going to go anywhere. For whatever reason, he said no. So when Ferris did the artwork, he put his son in in the role of Marty. Uh, and another example of kind of getting into the how the artwork and, and working with the theme is Apollo 13 from Sega. Uh, Tom Hanks is in the game. At least we imagined him to be because he's in the spacesuit. He wouldn't let his image be used in the game. So they put the visor down, the artist put the visor down. Now we all know Tom Hanks is kind of a seminal character in Apollo 13, or those that have seen the movie. And, but look who's dead center. It's not Tom. Tom said no. In my mind, that's Tom Hanks. I know the game, I know the movie. If I had a picture of the playfield, that is the story that I, that's being told on the playfield. Okay, that's it. Does anybody have any questions or any comments or um, any experiences? Anything that they'd like to bring up or mention? This is so, oh, go ahead. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, 2600 box art? My favorite 2600 box art. So, while I have a lot of 2600 games, I don't have a lot of box games. So I really, game-wise I like the Activision games, and I, for whatever odd reason, and I almost put it in here, I, I, Freeway is kind of, is, I really like it. It's the typical why did the chicken cross the road. It's their version of Frogger, and when you look at it, this is one of those games, personal experience, I actually walk through the aisles of Toys R Us, and for whatever reason, the chicken trying to cross the road was funny, and I bought that game. And that's what it is. I mean, the game looks very similar to the art. I was very happy with it. Then it made me a fan of Activision games, because I knew what I was getting into. Okay. Well, I appreciate your all's time again. I'm a... Uh, 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 Brent, for, and I'm, I can be reached at uh, Brent at Broken Token. Whitney out there, Whitney at Broken Token. You can find us out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Facebook at uh, slash Broken Token, Twitter at Broken Token, and occasionally we're still on the AOL network, and the BBS is down, so don't call. All right? I appreciate your time. Thank you.